Hi guys, we have a great opportunity here today with Kyle Vogt, the CEO of Cruise Automation. It's going to be a fascinating conversation. We'll get your cocktails after. It's a great thing to, to top off this very interesting day. So Kyle, without further ado, I think the biggest thing when it comes to self-driving cars that people want to know is it, it, it's about the race. Like who's going to get there first? What's it going to look like? And you have made a big deal about 2019. That's the year that you've said Cruise will be on the road. What does that actually look like? That's that's a good question, Sarah. I mean, like it, it has come to a little bit of a race. And you know, 2019 is the date we said, um, assuming that our current rate of improvement continues. I think it's really hard uh, for a product where there's an element of development and R and D that's never been done before, never really been in a customer's hands before, um, on knowing exactly when that's going to be ready. And for us, the gating metric is, is performance, and specifically around safety. Um, so it'll be ready when it's ready, but right now we think that's 2019. And what does ready mean? Is it you know, geofence paths that are, or, or is, it, um, is it cars that don't have steering wheels or pedals? Like, what, is, what does that, what does the fully automated future look like? What is that 2019 promise? Yeah, I think, um, well, for us, it's, it's a, a production vehicle that's deployed at scale in a major urban area. And the reason for all those qualifiers is that uh, we're interested in building a long-term sustainable business. And to do that, you know, these are expensive vehicles. They're business assets. Once you deploy them, you have to return that capital as quickly as possible, uh, as possible to, to have a good business. And so... Um, we're not interested in, in sort of being first to do a demonstration or anything like that. We actually want to be the first to build a, a large, sustainable, defensible business. So is that like, it could be anything from the car takes you to the airport and back to some specific locations, or it could be like a full-scale um, experience where you're telling the car where you want to go anywhere in the city and it takes you there? Yeah, I mean, it depends. I think, you know, the... Interesting thing about autonomous vehicles versus you know human drivers that exist on any rideshare program today is in a uh, no matter what rideshare platform you use, whether it's Uber or Lyft or whatever, when you get in one of those cars, the software that's driving it is is you know a human brain, and so roughly you know maybe one one experience versus another, a different car, a different service, you're going to have roughly the same level of of driving ability. But the thing that excites me about self-driving cars is. Um, a human level of performance is really just, you know, a stop along the way to something that could be far better. And, you know, as we've seen recently with AlphaGo Zero and other systems, you know, the best human performance in the world for any task, whether it's playing a game like Go or driving cars, is limited due to human factors. And when those start to fall away, when you have machines that exceed them, uh, I think it gets really interesting. You so you, can, you think once you get the cars out on the road and you're testing things and you're, you're gathering all this data, you, it's all going to accelerate really quickly from there. Yeah, yeah, and I think um, you know, there's probably an S-curve here, and I don't know exactly when human driving performance will, t or sorry, machine driving performance will tap out, but I think it's going to be far better than humans, and that's exciting to me. That's why I'm doing this and why most people, I think, are doing this is because of the profound impact that it can have on society. You know, we can eliminate car accidents and, and uh, really change the way people move around cities and, and um, you know, spend valuable hours of their day. Well, when it comes to the ingredients that get you there, obviously you just mentioned that collecting the data is a huge part of it. Uh, Tesla has a lot more real road miles that they've been collecting, um, more than a billion now, and a lot of competitors have, you know, in the thousands. How do you see that? Is, is that an advantage for them? Do, do you think that um, you'll have the same data stack to build on? Yeah, that's a good question. Um... If you use machine learning to, to power a system like a self-driving car, and most people are, including us, having access to really good data is important. Um, but actually, we found you know, our, our vehicles right now are tested predominantly in places like San Francisco and parts of Arizona. Um, we're not starved for data at all. We get plenty of data driving even small fleets of cars around a city. It's actually then what you do with that data to turn it into actual imp actionable improvements to the software or to the product that's the real challenge. Um, if it were as simple as just collecting lots of data, I think things would look really different than they are today. So let's give the audience a sense of where Cruise is now. You guys just had your first actual live product demonstration. How did you feel about the feedback that you got from people who tested out your vehicles? 
Yeah, I think um, this is exciting. So for, for those of you that don't know, we put you know, uh, reporters and, and GM investors in our cars and set them loose in San Francisco. Um, and and that's, that's a big deal. No one has really done anything like that before. Um, and this is unscripted. You know, we've, we came across taco trucks, people running into the middle of the street, you know, backhoes in the middle of None construction of it zones. <laughs> I mean, we wouldn't have even been that clever to do all the, all the weird things yeah. that happened during these rides. Um, and it was important for us to help. The reason we did this is to sort of bridge the gap, gap between perception and reality. Like, how good are these systems today? And the best way you can do that is by taking this technology and putting it in this real world environment uh, where it's actually going to perform as if it would if it were a commercial service. Um, and so, you know, I, I think you you figured out you, you did take down the perception a notch. The the wired headline called it herky jerky. Was that the word? Yeah, I think uh, that was a bit of an exaggeration, but uh, <laughs> it was you know it, it was. Um, but you you were able to show people, okay, this is our starting point. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a product that's still in development, and one thing that we emphasize is that our uh, metric that drives our engineering, like hundreds of engineers are working towards improving the safety and getting this closer to you know the hundreds of thousands or millions of miles it needs to go without making mistakes. And that's, that's uh, very different than just trying to make something where the steering wheel moves smoothly. That's, that's the easy part. The hard part is actually you know, getting to that, that level of reliability that you can launch a commercial product. And so it's so, better to be too safe. Yeah, and at this point along the, along the development roadmap, um, you know, we're less interested in, in, in uh, the, uh, the edginess of the ride and how it feels and more interested in producing a safe ride that can one day turn into a commercial product. Okay, speaking of safety, you just got acquired by this huge storied company. I mean, it's GM, more than a billion dollars last year, paid to acquire you. And you have this fast moving Silicon Valley startup. You're working with this legacy company. Are they too safe? I mean, is there any um, restriction to how fast you want to move? And is that a good thing? Um, well, first of all, it was like over 18 months ago, which feels like a decade at this point. Um, but um, it's a good question. I think, you know, uh, I've learned a lot in this experience and really come to value what um, automakers have, have developed and what they do really, really well, which is producing an extremely complex machine that has, you know, 30,000 parts. They'll produce it on time, on budget, and with a low defect rate. And uh, it's, it's a logistical symphony to see all that come together and work. Um, and it's something where all the fat has been trimmed out. These have become efficient over the years. It's really impressive to see all that work. Um, and so the, the way you work and the methodology you have to build a product like that looks very different than the early stage uh, startup might look, um, where the focus is on R&D and taking lots of shots and iterating quickly. Um, so when you put those two together, if you do it wrong, these things sort of just like bounce off each other and, and crash and burn. But if you do it right, you create something really special where you get sort of the powerhouse of an OEM and the resources behind it uh, with the cutting edge innovation in Silicon Valley. And I, I like to think that's where we're headed right now. Well, how do you balance when you really want to be you know, the, the person pushing innovation? That's probably why they acquired your company. And then you're working with this legacy uh, car company that has just different instincts about when things are ready and how much it needs to be tested before it's done. How do you balance when you push and when you don't push? Um, well, I, I think we're actually pretty well aligned on what it takes to make a, a safe product that you could deploy. Um, I think, uh, um, you know, even as a startup, there's, there's this attitude of like, we're going to solve the interesting tech problems and then things like making it super reliable or integrating it into a production vehicle and making sure all these diagnostic systems and everything play well together. Those are sort of seen as problems we'll get to later down the road, right? We'll, we'll solve the interesting stuff and then those are engineering problems too, we'll get to those. Um, but working with a company like GM, we have sort of the experts in the industry working on those bits and pieces, and we can work on the bits and pieces that we're really good at. Um, and so we're, we're together, we're still traveling to the same end state. I don't think you can launch a product. Um, there aren't many shortcuts you can take in this industry. It's really got to be good, and it's got to be safe. Um, and so I think really, you know, again, it's the same endpoint that we're shooting for before and after acquisition. It might actually help you in the regulation end of things if they already have relationships with all the different states that, you know, yeah. might yeah, could be. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, and, and, you know, we're working with NHTSA and other regulatory um, authorities and bodies because this is something new. And there's always a fear if you regulate something before you really understand it, you might have a problem because there's laws or something on the books that you have to backtrack on. Um, so we've been helping to, you know, tell our story and, and, and sort of um, maybe lay a framework for what the future might look like so that we can, we can be set up for success in the future. How, how big is this market? Um, it's big. So transportation, 
which is you know, sort of the market we're going after here more generally, is huge. And um, you know, uh, Dan Ammon, the president of GM, put this in really good perspective, which is if you look at rideshare today, you think these huge tech companies that are growing like crazy, well, they represent one-tenth of 1% 1 of all miles traveled in the US. And the main reason they're not bigger than they are is the cost of those services. And uh, a large majority of that cost is going to the human that's sitting in the seat, you know, chauffeuring you around town. If you can take the driver out of the equation and replace that with software, you can drop the cost dramatically, which increases the size of the market. So instead of 0.1% of all miles traveled, we could get up to 50 or 70% of all miles traveled in the US, which means I think autonomous cars, just in rideshare alone, not talking about package delivery or other things, could be 700 times bigger than what we think of rideshare today. Do you have a number for that? It ends with a T. Uh. It's big. Um, that could change, that could really be the change of the world promise, which is I think why there's so much hype right now. Um, we are seeing a lot of companies this year that have gotten there, have changed the world, start to question what they created and whether they did it the right way and if they pushed um, too fast for growth when they should have thought more about the implications. How do you think, as, as a company that, you know, is really in the beginning of its stages of impact. How do you think about your impact on society and, and affecting that now? Um, are you referring to company people, growth? Or? People are going to, you know, people who have driving jobs. That's like one of the sure. top professions in the country. Um, they're not going to have those jobs anymore. How do you think about that kind of trend and baking yeah. it into how you think about your job? It's, it's an important question and one we think about a lot. Um, I think today, though, we and others in the industry are in the phase of creating lots of jobs rather than eliminating them. There's, there's, uh, um, there's not that many products out there that you actually use yet. We're not actually displacing drivers. And I think, I think that will be a uh, fairly gradual tr transition. So those who are directly displaced, you know, hopefully we'll have some time to adapt and you know, we'll do our part to help, to help move that forward. Um, you know, but this isn't the first time technology, whether it's robotics or another form of automation, has, has changed the jobs that people have, and I think this is just one more example of that. Let's talk about um, something you know, more technical, LiDAR. You guys just acquired Strobe, um, supposed to make it a whole lot cheaper, a whole lot simpler to attach to cars. Um, it's, it's at the, uh, LiDAR's at the center of the Uber Waymo uh, dispute, right? It's caused a lot of issues. What does Uber, are they, are they screwed if they don't have LiDAR? Well, I'm, I'm not gonna comment on Uber, but uh, I will talk about LiDAR, because I think it's an important thing for self-driving cars. Um, you know, for the last, I would say, 10 or 15 years, people have been using LiDAR on self-driving cars because it's a great sensor, provides lots of valuable information about the environment around the car, but um, there was an assumption that because this stuff is so exotic and so expensive, it can never make its way into a commercial product. Um, well, I think that's only true because the sensors that have been around for the last 10 or 15 years were sold in, sold in such low volume and there's sort of these esoteric military applications that no one had actually tried or, or had pressure to bring the cost down. Um, but a number of those things have changed and now, um, you know, with Strobe, we have a path to getting LiDAR down to a single chip where it's costing hundreds of dollars, not thousands or tens of thousands. So all those assumptions about LiDAR being a, a, an exotic sensor that can't be used in a commercial product are now completely gone. And then, of course, if you ask any engineer um, who's working on self-driving cars, if I give you one development vehicle to work on that just has cameras and radar, one that has cameras, radars, and LiDAR, which one of these development platforms is going to get you to a commercial product faster and, and enable a higher level of safety? It's the one with LiDAR. Um, so I think it's an essential ingredient in uh, the self-driving cars of the future. It also makes it a lot more financially viable. Um, talk a little bit about how your company or your division of GM eventually makes money? Well, as, as we discussed before, it's a pretty big opportunity. And for us, the path to getting there um, is mostly about execution. And there are the obvious barriers, which are the technical ones, which is we have to get this product to the level of reliability and performance um, where it's going to be attractive to our customers. But then the other side of the equation is cost. And I think one of the interesting things that General Motors brings to the table is deep expertise in taking sort of fairly exotic technologies and then bringing out the cost out of them and then uh, moving to massive scale. And so for us, um, you know, step one is to get the technology to work. And as we're doing that, ramp up the scale, um, produce these vehicles on a production assembly line, which due to increased volume will drive down the cost. As the cost goes down, we can deploy in more cities and, and you know, move from urban areas into suburban areas. 
and doing that further increases the volume, which lowers the cost, and it sort of keeps going. Um, and, and even in the first sort of phases of that, I think the business gets really interesting. But I think what, what's really exciting is when the cost drops and we're able to deploy it on a much larger scale. What are the hurdles to that becoming a reality? It's, it's execution for us. And so for me, I think about, um, you know, we're, we're growing the company very quickly. We're at about 450 uh, full-time people in San Francisco today. And uh, we intend to grow that very rapidly. Um, and, you know, this isn't, this isn't a science problem at this, this point for us. It's more on just scaling a business, which the good news about that is, is um, that's not unique to self-driving cars. Any business in Silicon Valley runs into the same scaling challenges as it grow. And that's the thing that keeps me up at night. Not if you to, scale too fast, you don't have any, any institutional knowledge. If you scale too slowly, you don't right. take on the opportunities you need to take on. And I think the truth is this, like really cracking this nut and shipping a great self-driving car is not something a startup can do you know, and, and whip out a product in 12 months. It's going to take hundreds or thousands of engineer years of effort to create a system that emulates human driving at a level that, that I think is acceptable. Um, and so for us, it's about assembling that great team, continuing to build on that team, um, and, and focusing on efficiency and output along the way. It's time for our CB Insights game of over or underrated. Oh, boy. Ready? Bitcoin. Uh, overrated. Blockchain. Underrated. AI. Underrated. Facebook. Um, no comment. <laughs> Google. No comment. Wow. Autonomous cars. I think all of these companies may or if they're not currently, they're going to be in the autonomous car space soon. So I oh, so competitors, future right. competitors. You think even Facebook? I, I don't know. Like Google's doing it. All, all the other tech companies seem to be. So, so why not? Soon. Why not get in on the party? Yeah. Uh, autonomous cars. Underrated. Uber. No comment. <laughs> Robots. Um, Underrated. Cybersecurity. Underrated. Last one, Tesla. No comment. <laughs> you guys. We'll end on a high note. <laughs> you, it's OK to uh, trash your competitors a little bit. But I don't do that. OK. Well, it's OK. Th thank you for being you. And thank you for taking the time to give us your insight. Thanks for having me. Everyone, Kyle. Yeah.